Aloha, ahi ahi, aloha ke'i Jesu Christu, O'Brien Ko'inoa. My name is Brian. I have been coming here for quite a while, several numbers of years since before COVID. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be out here. We're going through what's called apologetics. So there's questions that people might ask you and so that we might have an answer. Uh, so I chose the one uh, on the list. It says, isn't being a good person enough? Isn't being a good person enough? I mean, we all want to be good, don't we? I mean, how many good people do we have out there? No one? We have one. No good people, so I assume you're all bad then. Or indifferent? That's a bad thing in church. So have you ever gone to somebody's memorial service or funeral? And sometimes you know the person, and you think, what are they possibly going to say? But they always come up with good things to say, don't they? I mean, they'll always tell about how good this person you is, and you think, wow, that's not my experience. But, you know, they, they come up with something just because they figure it has to be, they have to come up with something good, and then they'll a lot of times say, well, he was good, so then, so he must be in heaven or whatever. He must be going to heaven because he was good. But uh, we're going to look at the standard of good from a biblical perspective. And so when you go back uh, about 1,300 to 1,600 years ago, this is before Christ, way, you know, 1,300, over 1,000 years before Christ, uh, there was a man that went up on a mountain and God spoke to him and he gave him uh, things that he wrote on these little tablets of stone that he wrote it in stone. And what are those called? Ted Commandments, thank you. The good person knew it. <laughs> so Deuteronomy 5, uh, 6 through 21 has that list, and it's also recorded in uh, Exodus 20. Puts it twice, just because whenever things are important, they usually appear again. Down in verse 6, he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Number one. Number one, you shall have no other what? No other gods. He said, yo, he's the only one. He doesn't want to share that space. No other gods. Then he said, you shall not make for yourself an image in heaven or above earth, beneath, in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make any idol. Idol is the big thing. You know, now you, know, you watch TV and what do you see? American Idol. That's somebody that, you know, fans are voting for and worshiping and say, boy, this is, this is my idol. And God said, you shall not make for yourself what? An idol. So number one, he says, you shall have no other, I have to hear you, gods. And number two is, no idols. Then he said, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Now, have you ever seen anybody like, say, take a hammer and hit their thumb and say, John German? No, that'd be ridiculous, wouldn't it? You know, why would anyone do that? But yet, how many times have you heard somebody, they hit their thumb and they go, Jesus Christ. And I, whenever I hear that, I go, oh, do you, you're calling on Jesus? And they go, what? I said, do you know him too? And they're so confused because they don't even recognize they're saying a person's name. And yet that is exactly what it means by misusing the name of the Lord. But how did that ever begin? It just seems so stupid. Why would you say somebody's name? But what did, at least when I grew up, it was called swearing. You know, there's no swearing. And boy, you, if you swore, which, you know, a couple times, I would hear words that my brother said and thought they were cool and I would use them. And I'd get my mouth washed out with soap. And that was what swearing did. But he said, you're not to misuse the name of the Lord your God. But yet we hear it all the time, don't we? Like, where did that come up with, with people using Jesus' name as a swear word? 
therefore observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. The Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You know, Brady's talked a lot about this and how he himself learned about that and about taking a Sabbath day. And God knows, you know, and that's why you're all here today. You're honoring the Sabbath. So like, thanks for being here. Number five, honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live a long life and that it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God is giving you. So he's given us a command. Number five is what? Honor who? Who? Your mother and father. Are you doing that? Because he gives a command, but then he ends up by saying, so you may live long and then it may go well with you so he gives a commandment but yet then he takes it and says it's not for my benefit you know god doesn't that's not helping him anything but he's saying it's for you if you learn to honor your father and your mother it's going to go well with you and you'll have a long life those are promises and sometimes I know I've talked, I was fortunate to have a very incredible father and mother that loved the Lord. And my dad was superintendent of Sunday school. So guess where I was every Sunday? I was in Sunday school, had these perfect attendance pins. But it goes well with you. Some of you, I know I, I have friends that have just, from their stories, I think that's not possible. You know, how could a, how could a parent be like that or say things like that? But learning to honor your parents you know, God still has the promise. Six, seven, eight, and nine, or you should not murder, commit adultery, steal, give false testimony, or basically lie. And you should not covet your neighbor's wife. You should not desire your neighbor's house or land, his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. We don't have ox or donkey, most people, but we have a lot of possessions. And just, uh, Two days ago, I went to, for my first time, went out to Shangri-La. Any of you ever heard of that? It's a Doris Duke estate that's now part of the Honolulu Museum of Art. And it's a home of Doris Duke, who is a tobacco heiress, so she was extremely wealthy. Uh, for instance, she got married and went on a 10-month honeymoon and went around the world and would see things she likes, and she'd just buy it. Price wasn't a question. It just if she couldn't buy it for some reason because it was a ceiling in a building she found an artist that could do it and then have them pay for them to make a ceiling exactly like it for her and her home so this home is just an incredible thing and i'm perfectly happy about you know where i live and everything but when i see that i say you know it's, it'd be so easy to cover that there's a gorgeous view of the ocean it's right on the point where you can see the ocean and the beach. And then she built two stone, um, they're like groins that go out. So it stops the waves from coming in. So she has like a kind of private swimming pool. So kids always, you know, come in and use that because it's just an incredible area called Cromwell's. But it's so easy. You know, these commandments, they're all for our own good, not just for God. So the first one is, you shall have no other gods. You shall not make any idols, no idols. God is jealous. Don't misuse the name of God. So that's like no swearing, I would say. What's number four? Observe the Sabbath day, that's today. So thank you for doing that. Five, honor your father and your mother. You shouldn't murder, adultery, steal, or lie, and don't covet. These are the commandments the Lord proclaimed in a loud voice to your whole assembly. So I'm doing that today. They're on the mountain out of the fire, the cloud and the deep darkness. He added nothing more. He wrote them on two stone tablets, gave them to me. And then in Deuteronomy 6, these are the commands, the decrees, the laws, the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land you're crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, their children, after them, may fear the Lord as long as you live by keeping his decrees and commands that I give you. So
so that you may enjoy long life. There it is again. You obey the commandments. And again, it's not for his benefit necessarily. It's for yours. If you want to have long life, you obey the commandments. You know, you hear all these things on TV about all these things you can do to extend your life and the vitamins you can take and all the things. But God's told us right from the beginning. I'm telling you what to do. You do it and you'll have a long life. Hear, O Israel, be careful to obey it so it may go well with you and you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey just as the Lord your God promised your ancestors. And then he said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts, impress them on your children, talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. So how often should you talk about it? Always, because it's when you get up, when you go to sleep, and it, who are you to teach? You're to teach these to your children. And if you don't have children, teach them to somebody else's children. You're to talk about them. When you're here, when you're talking with somebody else, if you don't know what to talk about, talk about something that God's told you about. Talk about these things because God's told us to do that. And again, it's for our own good so that we'll have a long life and it'll be fruitful. So when you mess up, like say you don't obey one of these commandments and you know, we've all done that. Uh, what is that called? What? Sin. What? Sin. sin. Okay, that's what this is. And sin is like if you have a target and it has a bullseye in the middle and you're shooting for the target, but you miss the bullseye and you get something out besides that, missing the mark. That's basically what sin is. And Psalm 51, 5 tells us this. Psalm 51 verse 5 says, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Any of you have kids? Did you have to teach them to do wrong? Did you have to teach them to say no? It's just, it's inherited. It's, it's a biblical thing. You're born into sin from the time my mother conceived me. And then if you look over in Romans, Romans chapter 3 verse 23 it says for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God how many have sinned are you part of all it just says for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God so where and also oh let me see Paul had a dilemma about it in Romans 7 down in verse uh, 18 he says for I know that good itself does not dwell in me that is in my sinful nature for I have the desire to do what is good but I cannot carry it out for I do not do the good I want to do but the evil I do not want to do this I keep on doing now if I do what I do not want to do it's no longer I who do it but it's sin living in me that does it Anybody ever experienced this where you really want to do the right thing, but you don't? And you think, why? Why is that? Why do I keep blowing it like this? And that Paul had the same, same experience, and he realized it's just it's sin in me. So, like, where did all this begin? How can we have this battle between good versus sin? It actually started way in the beginning, back in the book of Genesis. And it's uh, Genesis uh, chapter 2. And we see this in Genesis 2. It said God made, in verse 8, he made a, an incredible garden. And he had incredible trees, all kinds of fruit, like anything you can imagine. Uh, apples, oranges, mangoes, papayas, probably all kinds of nuts as well like you know walnuts and 
almonds and cashews and macadamia nuts. I mean, every possible thing. And it's mo most likely that uh, Adam was probably a vegetarian because he just ate for, he had all these incredible trees to eat from. And it says the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. So have any of you, any of you rent a place where you're living? And have you ever read the lease agreement that you signed? You, know, you start reading, it says you're not to do this, you're not to do this, you can't do this, don't put holes in the wall, do the, and if, and if you do this, then you'll do this and this, and you'll be fine this, and by about the third page of those agreements, you just, you stop reading, you just sign and figure, whatever, I'm signing my life away, so, you know, what's one more? But here's Adam in this incredible Garden of Eden, and you'd think, okay, what's the lease agreement? What are the things I have to do to live here? How much do I have to pay? It says, you're free to eat. God says, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden. Oh, there's only one thing. You must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Have, ever, have any of you ever watched that show, That Naked and Afraid? they're dropped naked in this hor you know like these horrible environments and they have to survive and sometimes there'll be fruit on the tree and they won't know if it's safe to eat or not and every once in a while somebody will say no, i don't think that's probably if you don't know you should eat it and they'll eat it and then they'll get sick and have to tap out because it causes death and god's telling him right ahead you, you eat that fruit and you're gonna die i mean that's the only thing you can eat from every other tree. You can do anything, but just do not eat from that. I mean, that seems pretty simple, doesn't it? Just one little tree. Well, then it says that uh, he made Eve for Adam so that he wouldn't have to be alone. And it says Adam and his wife were naked and they felt no shame. And I wonder why that is. They're naked, they're not ashamed. They're just through, tooling around the garden. And I think it might be just because my own interpretation of it is Psalm 104 2. It says, God is clothed with light as with a garment. And I believe that they were probably clothed just like God in light. And so they didn't even notice. They were naked. It was no problem for them. And then in verse uh, chapter 3, all of a sudden Eve says, The serpent enters. And she, she said, The serpent says to her, um, did God really say you're not to eat from any tree in the garden? Oh, no, 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 the woman said. We can eat from any tree in, in the garden. Uh, it's just one. He, she, he said, you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Now, did God say that to Adam? No, he said you're not to eat it or you'll die. Eve adds on, you're not even supposed to touch it. And then the serpent says, you'll not, certainly not die. For God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be open. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and guess what he did? He ate it. Then the eyes of them both were open and they realized they were naked. What? They didn't notice before? I think they were probably closed with light. All of a sudden now, the light's gone. They notice they're naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made covering for themselves. How long are fig leaves going to last? I mean, that would not be very pleasant. Again, I've seen naked and afraid, and they try to make little clothing things, and they just, they're not good. It says, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They hid themselves from the Lord in the garden. And God, God called out to Adam, where are you? I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Guess what the man did? What we still do today, here's what Adam said. The woman you put here with me, she gave me some of that fruit and I ate it. What's that called? It's called the blame game. We all do it, don't we? It's like, oh, it wasn't me, it's because they, they forced me. 
It's like, I didn't really go through that red light. My car just, you know, went. And then the Lord said to Eve, what is this you've done? So what does Eve do? The same thing. It's the serpent who deceived me and I ate. You just put the blame on somebody else. Does that take it away? Uh-uh, it doesn't work that way. So then God, you know, cursed the serpent and everything, but then it says in verse 21 that the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. So an animal's blood was shed to provide clothing, to provide a covering for Adam and Eve. And it's just a foreshadowing of what would come in the future when not an animal's blood would be shed, but Jesus shed his own blood on the cross for us. And this is showing just in the Old Testament, uh, just a little revealing of what's going to happen. That in the Old Testament, an animal's blood was shed, but in the New Testament, we find it was Jesus and his own blood. So it said, the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he'd been taken. So that is really how the whole sin thing started from the very beginning. There's only one rule to follow. And so then after that, then God gave the Ten Commandments. So now we went from one to ten. And he said, if you do these ten things, you're going to have a long life. It's going to go well for you. And even those ten, do we have a problem with it? Yeah, nobody can say they were without sin, that they're always following every single commandment. And so you start thinking, you know, what should I even try to be good? I mean, the Jews even made, um, they had about 600 and some laws that they made restrictions. So as if 10 weren't enough. But Psalm 37, three says, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell on the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him and he will do this for you. Again, he tells you what to do. Trust in the Lord, do good, dwell on the land, take delight in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. And why? It's because when you commit your way to the Lord and trust in Him, you start learning what His heart is. And so your desires become His desires. And it's amazing what He can do for you and in your life. Because I know we all, like my, I love controlling my life and what I do and I'm very independent, but when I do it God's way, it always works out better. It's just, that's just how he made us, but it's, it's the promises that he's given us. In Matthew uh, 6, I mean Matthew 19, I'm sorry, Matthew 19 down in verse 16, it's also recorded in uh, Mark 10. It's the story of Kanaka Vaivai. Anybody know that, Kanaka Vaivai? It's a famous song here in Hawaii, and if you go to any entertainer in Waikiki or any place and say, Put in a request for Kanaka Vai Vai, guaranteed they'll probably know it. It's Make Alahele Oye Isu Ihala Vai Akuai Meke Kanaka Opio Hano Hano Kaulana Eka Vai Vai Pani Mahi Eka Opio E Kuhaku Mai Kai E Aha Hoi Kau E hana aku ai, iloaha eke olamau. And it's taken right from Matthew 19. It says, a man came up to Jesus and said, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? It's kind of what we're talking about today, is being good enough. So he wanted to know, what good thing can I do so that I can have eternal life? Jesus says, well, why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. So now Jesus says the same thing. If you want life to work for you, if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. And so this Kanaka says, Kanaka is like a man. He says, which ones? Jesus replied, 
You should not murder. You should not commit adultery. You should not steal. You should not give false testimony. Honor your father and the mother and love your neighbor as yourself. So he adds that one, but that's basically six things he tells this guy to do. Ending with love your neighbor as yourself, which we didn't see in the Ten Commandments, but he puts five of the original commandments and adds one, love your neighbor as yourself. This Kanaka said, all these I've kept. Is there anything that I lack? Jesus said, so that's a good dude. I mean, he didn't do, he's never disobeyed any of these commands. He honored his father and his mother. He didn't kill, he didn't steal, he didn't commit at all three. He loved his neighbor as himself. That's a huge one. How many of you have neighbors that you don't really care about? <laughs> They're noisy, that are not, you know, but he loved his neighbor as himself. But he said, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Wow, that's a great offer, isn't it? Just give away your treasure, come and follow me. I mean, most of the disciples, when they, when he said, come and follow me, they just dropped everything and went. This guy, it says, when the young man, the Kanaka heard this, Vai Vai means riches, Kanaka Vai Vai, the man of great riches. Uh, when he heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. So he gave up the chance of following Jesus because of his money. He couldn't give that up and Jesus knew that's what he really needed to enter and really have this uh, life that Jesus wanted him to have. But we don't know the end of the story. I'm sure hoping he went home and thought about it and just got rid of his stuff. But we've already talked a lot about sin, the commandments, and it says in 1 John 1, 8, so what do we do about it? It says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So that's the beginning is just every day we know we sin and we need to confess it. It's, it's so important that first of all, just confess it to God if there's somebody you've done wrong against it's really good to go to them and ask forgiveness and it'll i'm telling you it transforms it'll transform your life and do amazing things just to ask for forgiveness and then in romans 10 verse 9 tells us after we've confessed our sin what do we really knew you know is is uh is being good enough you know is just being a good person enough like to get to heaven like this when this kanaka asked jesus you know what's good and what can i what good thing can i do jesus said obey the commandments he gave him six commandments loving your neighbors yourself is one of them and then jesus uh here in romans 10 we have really the answer i think it's about if you want eternal life it says if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord. So if you declare what? 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 Jesus is Lord. Can you say it a little louder? Jesus is Lord. Much better. Thank you. So if you say that, it says, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. How many of you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead? It said, if you declare Jesus as Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Does it say anything about being good? That's always the excuse I get when I talk to people or I witness sometimes and they'll say, oh, no, you, I mean, you, there is no way. First of all, they don't want to set foot in church. Have you ever heard that one? Because all lightning will strike or whatever because, you know, if they were in church. But it's like church is like a hospital it's for people that are injured and hurting and god doesn't say anything about being good it has nothing to do with salvation it says if you forgive you ask forgiveness for your sins if you declare that with your mouth what do you declare i gotta hear it what do you declare much better 
and God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, for it's with your heart you believe and are justified. Justified means just as if you never sin. It says, it is with your mouth you profess your faith and are saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So if you haven't done that, I encourage you to do that today. You'll never be good enough. Is being a good person enough to get to heaven? What? And what are you to obey? The commandments. Obey the commandments. Trust in Jesus. Call on his name. And ask forgiveness. Confess your sins. If you believe Jesus, you are saved. If you aren't sure about that, talk to John, talk to me, talk to anybody here, because uh, that's the most eternal decision you'll ever make. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for uh, knowing that we can never be good enough for heaven, and uh, we're born into sin, but you've given us the promise that if we confess our sins, you're faithful, you're just to forgive us of our sins, and when we believe you and uh, we just declare Jesus is Lord we believe that you raised him from the dead thank you for the gift of salvation that we can spend eternity with you uh, just ask that you'll be with each person here I can walk with you you'll help them be obedient and that you'll bless them for doing it we thank you so much for everybody who's here open their hearts uh, father I pray that whatever the needs are out there today, that you will come and just meet those needs. As people ask you even silently now, that you'll come and just minister to them and whatever situation they're in, you know it, and you can just bring healing and health and happiness. Father, do a work here today. We thank you for your word, which is true, and it's truth and it will always come to pass. So we ask all these things and then Father, we're coming to you in the name of Jesus. Amen.